Okay. And do I need to stay on the stage in order? Do I? Can I can't walk over here, right? I should stay on the stage. I would stay on the stage. Stay on the stage. Stay on the stage. Yeah. How do we do a, science, a sound a, a sound test? You want to just go like this if you can hear me, okay? Or you can hear me, okay? Good. Okay, I'm ready. Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Oh, yes, you can hear me good. Hi, everybody. How are you this evening? Good, good. You've had enough beer? Not yet? Go get some more, right? I'm Bruce McFadden, and I'm the director of the Thompson Earth Systems Institute that was newly formed last year at the University of Florida. The mission of the Thompson Institute housed at the uh, Florida Museum of Natural History is to advance communication and public understanding of the Earth's natural systems, meaning air, water, life, and land, in Florida and beyond. You can learn more about us uh, by accessing, for those of you who do social media and website, you can access, access us using those platforms. Events like this don't just happen. They require an immense amount of coordination and planning. I'd like to thank the folks who have helped make this possible, um, including the team from the Thompson uh, Earth Systems Institute. Jennifer Bauer, would you please raise your hand? Rebecca Barton, our communications manager. Adania Fleming. Thanks, Adania. Sadie Mills. I'd like to also thank Justin Pearl, our speaker, for driving up here to uh, make his presentation this evening. Thanks to all of you. I'd also like to thank Chelsea Collinson in the back, allowing us to partner with exhibits and public programs at the Florida Museum of Natural History to do the Science on Tap tonight. This is really exciting. A great turnout. Thank you all for coming. OK, now I'd like to uh, welcome Dr. Jennifer Bauer to the podium. And she will introduce our speaker, Justin, for this evening. Here and here. There's too many things. Too many things. You want that in your pocket? Oh, you forgot this. You can, you can okay. Thank you. Okay, so we also have another event tomorrow. If you guys are on campus, it's called Beyond Dead Fish, How Red Tide Affects All Floridians. So this will kind of uh, be a discussion based uh, event as well, which will talk about the economic impacts, health impacts and environmental impacts of red tide. So if you have more questions after our event tonight, please stop by tomorrow as well. Uh, okay. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Justin Peralt, who is the Director of Research at the Loggerhead Marine Life Center, um, with uh, an emphasis on sea turtles. Um, some of his research is actually very interesting. He found the first documented case of uh, red tide in offspring, so there's a transmission from uh, parents to children, which is something I found very interesting. Um, so with that, please welcome uh, Justin. Okay. Hi, everybody, and uh, thank you. Okay. Down lower. All right, hello everybody. Uh, thank you so much for coming. I'm really excited to, to talk to you guys today about um, sea turtles and, and red tide and its effects on these organisms, these really remarkable organisms. 
Um, so as mentioned, I am the director of research at Waterhead Marine Life Center, and um, my boss would kill me if I didn't at least plug the center a little bit, so I'll start out with telling you a little bit about what we do. So we're not just, uh, with, you know, primarily when you come to Waterhead, you see a uh, sea turtle rehab facility. All of our, our patients are outside. We're first and foremost kind of a hospital, like you can see up there on the right, where we treat about 100 to 120 patients every year. Um, we're also a research facility. I run the, the research program. Uh, we monitor about nine and a half miles of, of nesting beach, and we are one of the most densely nested seasonal beaches in the world, and I'll show you some photos of that a little bit later. We have a very prominent education program as well. We have about 50 uh, STEM-based education programs, and we reach 65,000 students every year. And we also have a conservation program that goes out and claims the beach monthly. They have responsible peer initiatives that will teach fishermen what to do if they've accidentally caught a sea turtle on a line. It teaches them how to uh, recycle fishing line, fishing gear, throw away their cigarette butts responsibly, and a lot of things like that. So we have a, a really, truly global facility that with a very far reach. Um, and again, I need to plug this, so we are undergoing a capital expansion, a $20 million expansion, where we will double the size of our square footage, we'll double the number of tanks that we have. Um, at the moment, we can house maybe a couple dozen turtles at a time, and when it gets really busy, like it is right now in the spring, sometimes we'll have to turn the patients away and we want to make sure that that doesn't happen anymore. So we are undergoing this really large expansion to build a full service research lab, a uh, number of scientific classrooms and uh, uh, broaden the hospital and our equipment and things like that. So we're really excited about this expansion. We broke ground a couple weeks ago. Um, so this is just kind of a, an example, a snapshot of, of a one kilometer stretch of our beach. You see on the bottom there where Lumberton Green Life Center is located. And each one of those dots represents a sea turtle nest on our beach from 2017. Um, in that year, it was the record year for sea turtles on our beaches. We had 19,000 nests in about nine and a half miles. So it's, you know, anywhere you step essentially on our beach here in the summer, you're hitting a sea turtle nest that equates to about one nest every three feet. And we get about 5% of the world's nesting loggerheads on just our nine and a half mile stretch. So coming kind of back to the sea turtles that we have in Florida, there are five really well-known species that we have either that nest on our beaches or that are found in local waters. I'm on the top left there, my personal favorite, the leatherback, the native vanguard ground for about 100 million years. They're known as first last living dinosaur. They reach 600 to 800 pounds at maturity. The largest one ever is 2,000 pounds, and they do that on a diet of jellyfish. Uh, the green turtle that you see there in the middle is kind of that second one. There are herbivorous species, my least favorite of all of them, the turtles. Uh, they're a little finicky, but known for their, their name of the they're, they're known for uh, their, their diet of seagrasses and they eat so much grass their fat turns green, which is where they get their name. Um, the loggerheads on the top right are kind of Florida's bread and butter, the turtles that we really see the most of here. We get about 100,000 nests every year in Florida. On the bottom left and the bottom right are two of the more rare species that we do get in our waters, and rarely we get nesting. Uh, the Kemp's Ridley, which is one of the more endangered of the seven species that we have in the world primarily nests in Mexico, and then the hopscore, which uh, nests more down in the Caribbean. And every now and then, we will get a special sixth species known as the olive ridley. They tend to be down in the southern Atlantic Ocean um, and in the Pacific, but every now and then, you'll get a confused animal that will come all the way up. This turtle uh, was the seventh stranded uh, olive ridley ever in the state of Florida. We satellite tagged him. His name was Burt Reynolds. Um, we found out we did some hormone analysis and found out Burke was actually a bird uh, um, actor, so it was named for the actor um, that was in our, in the our center. So moving on to a little bit about red tide. Uh, you know, we're all in Florida. Red tide has, has been a really hot topic for uh, quite some time now due to the really bad uh, event that we had over the last year. So it's caused by this harmful algal species known as Carinia brevis. You see up there on the top left, and there's a kind of a micro, uh, light micrograph on the right. And when the concentration of these cells get too high, what happens is it kind of can turn the water in this reddish color, sometimes a kind of a greenish red tint. And these 
Algal species have a toxin inside of them known as bretotoxins, and these are neurotoxins. So when they enter the body, either through um, the different mechanisms that I'll talk about in a minute, it can cause a lot of a lot of problems. These animal animals that are exposed to bretotoxins can um, become lethargic or comatose if they're exposed for too long. There's kind of this muscle twitching that will occur, um, and eventually, if they're exposed for extended periods of time, it will lead to death. And kind of what you typically see with uh, red tide, the first thing that you normally notice is a lot of these fish strandings. Sometimes we get millions of dead fish that will wash up in the state. And that's because fish are exposed first. So if you think of the differences between like a fish and a sea turtle, fish is rep uh, respirate in the water, so they breathe through their gills, whereas sea turtles and birds and mammals have lungs, so they come to the surface to breathe. And the fish are essentially, when they're red tide, they're in the water, what they're doing is they're respirating those toxins directly across their gills. And so that is why the fish are affected first, because they're kind of directly exposed where there, as there's a little bit of a lag time with some of the other animals. Um, so just a little bit of chemistry. I don't want to talk about this too much, but this, this is what toxins look like. They're these kind of long polyether structures we talk about, uh, we call them. And there's about nine to 14 different types of toxins that are known. They are lipid soluble, meaning that they bind heavily to fat. So when they're ingested in the body, what will happen is the brevitoxins will either bind to um, fat stores that an animal might have, or they might be distributed to other fatty organs, primarily like the liver and oftentimes the kidney. So organisms are exposed to brevitoxins through two primary routes and there's a third potential route that I'll discuss. So one of the routes is how we as humans are exposed. So if you've ever gone to the beach, um, during, has anybody ever gone to the beach during a red tide? Yeah, it's not very much fun. You cough immediately, it kind of causes these upper respiratory tract irritation. Um, and it's not really too problematic for humans. The impacts of breathing in these toxins are pretty acute. Once you move out of the area where the red tide might be, your, your symptoms kind of go away unless you have some chronic um, respiratory issues like with uh, like asthma or COPD or something like that, you get some pretty serious illnesses from it. But generally, I think it's pretty good. Um, sea turtles, birds, and animals, as they come to the school, all of these toxins become terrified. The cells are pretty good. They get trapped in these water, the bubble of the water, and the wave action, and then cells go to the surface, it releases the toxin in the air. So any animals that are foraging or breathing at the surface near those toxins will then be exposed that way. So inhalation is one primary route of exposure. Another potential route of exposure that really hasn't been explored is across the dermis or the skin. So if you're swimming through a bunch of these toxins, it, you might have some uptake through the outer layers of the body, but again, that hasn't been fully explored. But the primary route is through the diet. So, Gravitoxins and red tide can lead to paralytic shellfish poisoning in humans. So if you go out and eat, eat a bunch of shellfish like oysters and clams during a red tide, it's, first of all, it's not a very good idea um, because these toxins will distribute into the organs of those of those organs of those animals. And when you eat those, then those neurotoxins get released in humans. It can cause vomiting, diarrhea, um, muscle twitching, some tremors, a lot of the same things that you often see in the animals. So sea turtles are really no different because they forage on a lot of things that humans like to eat as well. So this is a, a hospital turtle, so that's not a natural diet. That's the best picture you can find of a turtle eating. Um, so loggerheads and Kim's Ridley's are kind of the most primary, primarily affected species because they forage on these filter feeding animals. So they forage on things like the, the bivalves, like oysters and clams, or crustaceans and mollusks. That really filter the just those other animals that finally accumulates and then the effects take place. So that's why there's often kind of a lag time between the fish that's draining first and kind of some of the other larger vertebrates that you see later. Um, so again, you all probably remember the recent red tide. It started uh, right after Hurricane Irma uh, made landfall in September of 2017. So this red tide, this is kind of when it was the worst, is this picture here. Um, so oftentimes what happens after a hurricane is there's a lot of nutrients that get uh, runoff. It, it causes runoff into water. And you know, they're algal species, so they like things like nitrogen and phosphorus that are um, very common in, in runoff in Florida. 
and then his words will get worse. So this was really the worst, probably the worst red tide that Florida has ever seen. We saw over 1,300 sea turtles stranded from the, during the red tide from October of 2017 through January of 2019. And about half of those were attributed to the red tide, which is the highest number of sea turtles that stranded ever as a result of, of this kind of natural phenomenon. So typically what we see is red tide on the west coast of Florida. So like Sarasota and Tampa Bay, those areas are really heavily hit. And red tide kind of originates offshore and it will move onshore. And then there's proper wave action and salinity and temperature and all of these different nutrients and things in the water. These blooms will really um, proliferate. So typically we see it on the west coast, like I said, but oftentimes what you have is you have the loop current that goes down around Florida and hits the Gulf Stream. And so if the toxin or if the red tide molecule or the red tide uh, organisms are bad enough, they'll get entrained in, the, in those currents and get delivered to the east coast of Florida. So we had the first red tide on the east coast in 2018 um, in over 10 years. So it was a really, really remarkable event. You see up there in the Panhandle on the west coast down in the Keys and even over on the east coast. It truly was statewide. But, you know, there is hope. I want to get in my brief, you know, PowerPoint with, we are working towards figuring out at least how to treat the animals that strand as a result of the red tide. But what we, what our vet at Long River Marine Center has done is he read a lot of the human literature on uh, drug overdose cases in humans. And a lot of these drugs are lipophilic, meaning they bind heavily to fats. And so there's something called intravenous lipid emulsion or ILE. And if you pump that directly into the bloodstream of a human, those drugs will bind to those fats and become released or become inert. And so it really severely reduces overdose cases. And so that thought, hmm, that sounds a lot like Revitas, and they're fat, they bind to fats, um, that cause a lot of these problems, so what can we do? So what we do is we pump this ILE directly into the bloodstream of the sea turtles, and typically, um, without this kind of treatment, a turtle can't really recover from brevitoxicosis for maybe a couple months to a few months. But with this treatment, the veterinarians that are working with us are now showing that the symptoms are reduced in 24 hours. So we've now brought the, these, these really problematic symptoms down to a very low, short, very short time period. And we just received a grant from Morris Animal Foundation to analyze a lot of these toxins. In the, in the plasma or the blood of the animals to see really what's going on, if they're clearing the toxin as a result of the drug, or if maybe it's binding and making the toxin inert and reducing some of those neurologic effects. But there is hope for at least the turtles and the birds and things like that. We are learning ways to kind of combat this. Um, but again, it is a natural phenomenon and there's, you know, there's a lot that we can do. So I wanted to kind of end on this positive note. And I'm really excited to answer your questions today about red tide or sea turtles and have to be about sea turtles and red tide um, anything you guys want to ask i'm happy to hear your answer yeah so um i did a study in 2016 on in sarasota i'm sorry i'll repeat the question so she just wants to know how it's transmitted from mother to offspring. So that's going to be a little bit of a long answer, but yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, so in 2016, we sampled nesting females on the beach for their blood to see if they had any toxins in the blood. And then we looked at eggs and hatchlings and analyzed the brevitoxins in all of those tissues. And we did find correlations between what was in the mom and what was in the offspring. So again, I remind you that these brevitoxins bind heavily to fats. Now, sea turtles are capital breeders, meaning that they, when they come to the nesting beach, they don't forage, they don't eat. So they gorge for a year and a half, two and a half years on their foraging ground, and then they come to the nesting ground and they don't eat. During that time, if they're accumulating brevitoxins in their fat, what will happen is, uh, so what can happen is that oftentimes on those foraging grounds, they're also making their eggs. So those toxins, that are in the body will then get distributed to the eggs, which are very rich in fat as well. So if they're eating the food while they're making their eggs, then all that will get transmitted. In the yolk? Yes, so primarily we didn't um, separate the components from yolk and albumin that are in 
being an egg of a turtle or you know, of anything really egg laying. Um, but primarily, yes, we would predict it to be the only one. Yeah, so it's, in the, it's primarily in the yolk. We haven't done the analysis to see if it is in the albumin or not, because we just did the entire egg contents mixed together. But my prediction would be, yes, it would be primarily in the yolk, because that's the fattiest part of the egg. So if you got, um, we do have a mic going around, so we'll wait for the, the mic to get to you so that the people in the live stream can hear. There's been a lot of discussion about the influence of pollutants, uh, plastics, and so on on red light. Um, but in the last couple of days, there was a report of the paper that said that uh, sea currents may be the primary cause of the red light this past year. What's your take on this? Uh, yeah, so there is um, so there is no direct link between pollution and the frequency of red tides. We are seeing increases in harmful algal blooms as time goes on. So there likely is some kind of anthropogenic or human-induced component. But red tides actually originate far enough offshore, away from areas of a lot of this, this nutrient runoff. And when they come inshore, those pollutants might then make the red tides worse, but it doesn't necessarily cause the red tide, cause the red tide. So primarily red tides do start naturally. They are very natural. Um, so again, if you've got uh, wind, wave, temperature, salinity, all of these things that add up really nicely for these blooms to happen, that's typically what happens. It happens naturally and it might get exacerbated by human impacts. Hello. Um, how does climate change impact this whole situation? So climate change, obviously, these are these are essentially tiny little plants, and plants like warm environments. So if you've got an increasing climate, um, typically what you would think is that these red tides would get worse through time as time is warming. So which is what we're seeing. I kind of answered there. Yes, climate change could definitely cause these tides to be. To, to last longer. So the reason why tide, these red tides kind of dissipate is probably the conditions for their growth are declining mostly with temperature. So they only really bloom between like 60 and 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And so once water temperatures drop below that, they'll all kind of die off. But if our water temperatures continue to rise, these blooms might last a little bit longer and then might also increase their, their where they're found. So we might find them in more places along the Gulf or on the east coast of Florida, like we saw, you know, it's pretty rare, rare to get them in the panhandle as well. So that's, you know, we're already seeing this, this spread. Hello. Uh, is one species of sea turtle more prone to red toxic accumulation than others due to their fat content? So, yeah, uh, not due to their fat content, but yes, due to their diet. So that is one of my quick questions. So the loggerheads and the Kemp's Ridley's are the turtles that we see that strand primarily during red tide. Um, so those are the animals that are foraging on those filter feeding animals like your crabs and mollusks and things like that. That really accumulate these bronotoxins and harbor them in their bodies for a really long time. So primarily loggerheads and Kemp's are more susceptible. Um, we do get green turtles that strand. Green turtles are herbivores and there are some you know, they, they eat the seagrass, and there are some little tiny animals on seagrasses that can accumulate these river toxins, but it doesn't really seem to impact the greens as much. Um, the leatherbacks are the fattiest sea turtles, if you were to pick one, but they really don't seem to be impacted, most likely because they're not really around when the red tides are happening. But yeah, longer hands and hands. Hi, so I think you kind of answered my question before, but um, you showed the map of where the red tides were found, and you can almost, it looked like you can almost draw a line across the state where it just stopped. Is that mainly due to temperature, or are there other factors? Yeah, so temperature could be one thing. You know, and typically in Florida during red tide season, it's, it's warm, during, warm enough during the, the season. However, 
Um, if you think about currents, is the really the big thing here. So I'll just come over here. So you've got the Gulf. So your loop current kind of comes down around Florida and then meets the Gulf Stream over here, and then the Gulf Stream comes up really close to kind of Palm Beach County and Martin County here, and then it kind of juts off a little bit. So a lot of those red tide might not necessarily be delivered as far north in Florida. Um, it may kind of jut out into the open ocean and then maybe get too cold or the conditions might be good for them to kind of die off. Um, there have been a couple occurrences where it does reach as far north as North Carolina, but that's really rare. So typically it's probably a result of the currents. How do you explain the development of the panhandle? The, the development of the panhandle? The, the red tide on the panhandle? That one's a little trickier. So, again, red tide, or the red tide organism, Prina brevis, is always in the Gulf. It's, it's naturally there at low concentrations, but there's oftentimes, with the currents that are present in the Gulf, sometimes those currents break off and make these little eddies that transmit the tides elsewhere. So currents aren't perfect. You know, they don't always just go down and up. Sometimes they break off and form these kind of loops up north. And so that's probably, that's my best guess as to what happened here is kind of those little eddies that form off currents that might bring the red tide further north into the panhandle. So I think it's great that you're doing all that research and some new strategies for saving sea turtles from this tiny and rough problem. Um, but I mean, it's a little overwhelming, right? Did you say 1,300 sea turtles stranded and how many do you have room for? And then what happens if the red tide persists for months and can you reintroduce them or do you have to like hold them until the tide falls and, and how many did you actually reintroduce into the wild successfully? So I don't, the last part of your question I don't have a direct answer but unfortunately this red tide it was so bad that most of the animals that were washing up were dead. Um, I believe about 90 percent of the sea turtles that washed up during this red tide had uh, mortality that occurred already. Um, Luckily, the state has a really great um, stranding response program. So not everybody, not every turtle facility on the West Coast took these patients. You know, they send them all over the place. So they might, uh, this time there were actually, there wasn't a lot of turtles that stranded alive that needed treatment. So that was, you know, it's, it's disheartening. But in other years where they do survive, what would happen if they would kind of send those turtles to as many places as they can that will hold them up, you know, even up to Georgia and some of their facilities. Um, we would get some, you know, even on the East Coast, even if we didn't see any red tide at the coast. So, you know, it depends on the year, and it's kind of hard to give a direct answer, but, you know, depending on the year, there's usually enough facilities to house these animals. Um, some people double up, triple up their tanks, you know, we do whatever we really can. To, to make sure the animals are, are placed well. But as far as releasing them, yeah, you don't wanna we don't want to rehab them and then stick them right back in the in the toxin water. Um, so what we'll usually do is either we can wait for there's a lot of studies now looking at turtles and red tide avoidance strategies. So what we'll do is we'll put a satellite tag on the you know, sea turtles to see where they're going during a red tide event. And some of them seem to avoid the blooms, but some of them swim directly through it, so there may be some kind of avoidance of the turtle, but yeah, you know, we don't typically release them directly back into the red tide. We might wait a little bit. Yeah, Jennifer, you're lasted from October 2017 to January 2019. Did you see a drop in uh, nesting in 2018? Um, well, I'm not sure. Now, the West, the West Coast numbers are actually good. They did all right. They, I'm not exactly sure of how the numbers did, but um, as far as I know, 2018 nest numbers of loggerheads were 
pretty good. There were there wasn't a record year, but right. it was one of the highest years on record, maybe top five. So okay. it doesn't seem like it impacted the population too negatively. Okay, great. Have there been any studies that either you have done or others have done on um, impacts to predators of the sea turtle eggs and hatchlings um, that have been contaminated with the Korea virus reptoxin? So I haven't. The only one that I can think of is a study out of Texas that looked at um, feral dogs and that were on the beaches, and they did find some mortality of the predators, um, but my guess is that probably one of the results of the eggs is probably a result of um, potentially maybe eating some of the dead fish that washed up on the beach. Okay, thank you. Hey, as you know, I have a question in terms of uh, education and outreach. Could you talk a little bit about any upcoming initiatives that you may have at the new center? So we had, you know, at, um, at Loverhead, this was a new event for us. You know, like I said, we haven't seen red tide on our coast in over 10 years. And so it's all kind of new as far as education initiatives on, on our coast. But I know that a lot of places on the west coast do have education initiatives like low marine laboratory, the blue water where we're going to do things um, to, to teach students and a lot of people about, you know, proper waste disposal and not utilizing too many fertilizers, maybe more natural ways of fertilizing your plants and things like that. But yeah, as far as like our center, because red tide is so rare over there, we don't have a whole lot yet, but it might, it's, it's something that I believe that we might be developing. But that's our education department, we've got a little bit more about that. Okay. Um, I know you're a scientist, but could you give us your two cents on what kind of public policy can help address the problem? Yeah, so the biggest thing that, um, uh, you know, like I mentioned, red tides are natural, so there's really no way to stop them, but the biggest public policy is environmental awareness, and we've got to stop using all of this fertilizer. Um, that's, we've got to find more natural ways to kind of grow our plants and and things like that. So that's the biggest thing that I think that we can do is we can really hone in on what we're putting out in the environment and what we're using because the red tide aren't getting better. Um, so yeah, just kind of public awareness of, of what you do in your everyday life and what you use and the products that you use that might be detrimental to the environment. Can you think a little bit about the effects of And the offspring, and also I had another question about are there any organisms that can actually keep a red tide organism safe? Uh, so we did see a deep with, with nests that had higher gravitoxin in the eggs, we did find a lower reproductive success. So the, the fewer eggs hatched from the nest that had more gravitoxin. However, the sample size for that was very, very small. So we are actually um, replicating that study this year um, due to the recent red tide to really see kind of some more effects. And what we're also going to do is collect some dead hashlings and see if there's any abnormal pathologies that might occur as a result of this transfer and exposure in the egg. Um, I will say the good news is, is that when an organism ingests gravitoxin, those two parent compounds that I showed, those are the most toxic. But typically, once it enters the body, it gets processed by a lot of the organs and detoxified into these other metabolites that are less toxic. And those are going to be the ones that are transmitted to the egg. So we did um, an analysis of the different types of those congeners in, in the egg, and we didn't find any of those parent compounds in the egg. So that's good. Uh, what was the second? What was the second? The second question, is there anything that can safely eat red tide? Oh, yeah. yeah, so there are, yes, um, a lot of things do eat red tide, small zooplankton, well, 
Well, yeah, there's a lot of things in the environment that people get. Um, safely, not really sure because there's been a lot of studies on crab larvae and fish larvae and things like that that might be eating these red tide organisms and they're showing die offs in the lab. So, just because they can eat them doesn't mean it's safe. So you said that the 2018 Nielsen season with the record is uh, an evidence success for our conservation program? Absolutely. So if you look about 20 to 30 years ago, um, sea turtle nesting in the U.S. really dramatically declined. Um, and then there was the implementation of something called turtle excluder devices in fisheries. And they didn't really get it right. Initially, they were uh, the devices, I believe, were too small. And so a lot of the older life stage classes were dying, but the juveniles were surviving. And so we saw this huge decline in mass numbers that were killing a lot of these adult turtles in the fisheries. And then once they realized that the opening wasn't large enough, they, they, they kind of opened it, and then all of those juveniles then matured that survived. And then that's why we're probably seeing these increases in nest numbers now. Is, likely the result of um, those changes in like shrimp trawling and fisheries. Also just increased effort. You know, every single sea turtle beach in Florida is monitored by somebody during nesting season. So we're out there protecting the eggs, we're marking the females, and we're really paying attention to the population. Now that doesn't mean our job is done. Um, at the center, 100% of our turtles have plastic in their stomach. So, we won, I think, one battle, at least in the U.S., but this plastics battle is, is really alarming. So is there a lag time, a potential lag time, as they're building this up? Would you expect that in three years post this event, say 2021, 20, to see a drop in hatching success? from all these turtles that might have been feeding on these dead fish and so forth? That's a great question. And, you know, we talked about a project idea and I was sitting down with you and maybe we should look at that. Um, it's absolutely possible because when you're ingesting toxins frequently, essentially what's happening is your body is busy you're using a lot of energy to fight those toxins or detoxify and get rid of them. And that leaves a lot of a less available energy for the kind of the luxury functions of the body, like growth and reproduction. So this constant exposure to a toxin could absolutely, in the future, lead to this, this increase in success is a great point, something we should really watch out for. And uh, projections are going to increase dramatically unless uh, we change our ways rapidly. Um, and take a long time to build a beach. What is the long term What's the long term prognosis if we don't aggressively deal with climate change in terms of just having nesting places for these organisms? Yeah, so some of the things that we're doing right now are, are beach renourishment, but that can't last forever. Really. And it's, you know, we see it on our beach, we re-nourish Jupiter every single year, and every single year in about two to three weeks, it's hand washed away. Um, you know, the prognosis is, it's, it's a little scary. You know, I'm, I'll be honest, it's, it's, you know, the, the change is, is happening a little too slowly. I think um, some options that we might have are, are nest relocations or something like that, where people might lay for eggs and put them in a nest box in an area away from the beach, but when that happens, you get a lot of declines in reproductive success, you know, so that, and you get alterations in you know, natural temperature regime and all of these things. So um, that's one potential option is relocation, but until we really stop this, this warning, it's going to be hard to do that. So back to that plastic thing again. Uh, do you see differences in 
quantities or types of plastics depending on what the turtle, what species of turtle is feeding on what kind of food? So this, the plastic research in the U.S. is actually pretty new. Um, what we are finding is that um, there's a paper that just came out called uh, plastic ingestion is ubiquitous in marine turtles, meaning that every single sea turtle does ingest plastic. As far as the type of plastic that they would ingest, it would it would probably be different depending on what the animal is eating. So, <clears throat> like a leatherback forages in the water column, um, kind of in the open ocean on jellyfish, and so if there's any plastics in those animals, those plastics might be more a floating type of plastic. That might be a different signature than you might see of the animal that forages on the bottom, like a green turtle or a, a loggerhead or you know, most of the other ones, um, where they might have more of the signatures of the plastics that float. Um, but it's also dependent on life stage class. So our little little um, hatchling turtles that forage in the sarcastic sea are eating tons of that floating plastic. So it will just depend on the life stage class of the animal. But yeah, it would probably differ just depending on, on the species and what they're eating. That's an easy question. Yeah. Uh, how much temperature can the surf water tend to be to change the gender of that uh, machine? So, uh, the temperature in some places is already there. Um, so, I was just talking back there about this, and there is a beach in Boca where they've been monitoring sex ratios for the last, I think, 15, 20 years. And they don't have a single male loggerhead on the beach in the last five years. So, for those of you that don't know, um, sea turtles have temperature dependent sex determination. Meaning that generally, the temperature of the nest determines the sex of the offspring. So, in sea turtles, we use the term hot chicks, cool dudes. So, uh, the hotter the nest, the usually more female and the cooler the nest, we typically it's more male. We're finding that it's not quite so kind of dry. Um, it might differ by its location, the moisture content, all these different things. But yeah, and a lot of these beaches already in the world, the pivotal temperature where you get that 50 50 ratio of that is not far surpassed. And there was a recent study out of Australia um, where they did a some hormone analysis of I think, thousands of turtles in the world that were in, and I think they found like 90 percent in green turtles. Well, I mean, have we been relocating? You know, it's just a, uh, it's not my direct area, but uh, it's hard to say. So the Atlantic subpopulation, well, this is the water, I think it's kind of the most important and most prolific over here. And the floor is very hot. There's likely going to be a lot of females produced. Um, however, we have to remember that loggerheads nest in a bunch of different areas around the southeast of the United States. They go all the way up to North Carolina, even in Virginia. I think there was a nest in Maryland that hops recently. So there's some people that are thinking that perhaps the more northern population might be driving the male trends, and maybe there's enough. Um, but yeah, there, there is the uh, Unfortunately, a lot of people that are doing a lot of the temperature research, it's, it's very long term. So the, the publishing of it is kind of very slow. So it's just hard to kind of say that that's kind of what I've heard is that the more northern population are kind of cooler, they might be driving the male trends. Um, but we certainly have no shortage of uh, turtles and nests and you know, nests at the moment. So as of now, it doesn't seem to be that the sex ratio is skewed, but it's definitely could be a problem right now. It could be, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Um, so my question was, do you know of occurrences of red tide happening in other places in the world, and if it's caused by? Yeah, so red tide does occur um, 
aside from the cultural, we do get red tides in Mexico from the same organism. Um, there are other tides, all, red tides all around the world. There's red tides on the west coast of the United States, there's red tides in Asia. It's just a different species um, that causes them. There are multiple species of Carinia, um, not the same ones that we see here, but yeah, there are multiple different types of, of red tides and green tides and brown tides and all of these different types of tides called red tides. Do you think they're affecting the sea life there in some other way, or is it different species that's going to affect um, weather population in that area? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. So, just to give you an example, there's a, um, a diatom, which is another you know, small kind of algal species known as Sulinichia, that produces a dimoic acid, which is a, another type of, of toxin released from kind of these things in microorganisms. And it does cause some. And negative consequences for the majority mammals that might be for the and California coast, something like that. So, yeah, there's definitely other impacts. And I actually just reviewed a paper recently on looking at saxitoxin, which are another toxin from algal, another form of algal toxin down in South America. So, it was causing a big thing. The lead that it caused is, is terrible. Yeah. I have one more geography question. Um, <laughs> when you look at the map here, you can see. The red tide, very close to the not present. So, what is what is causing any kind of slowly teeter off in that area if not present? So, I mean, my guess, I'm not 100% sure on this one, but um, typically what will happen is the wind patterns at the time push it. And that's where that's, you know, the balloon will originate offshore. And then, like, red patterns push it towards the shore, so that's why you can really see it close to the shore and just go to the wind direction. Given that there are multiple isomers of death toxin, and we can meet that up, do you see a, a number of different isomers that are, you know, that are present at one time? And then, what I know, there are different toxicities with these different isomers. So, how do you sort out, you know, which ones are, are truly toxic to these animals versus that being present? Yeah, so there are a number of different isomers found in the animals, particularly if you've got a freshly stranded animal during an act of their tide, you're going to see those kind of parent compounds like PDS. PTF1 and 2 are the parents that really form all the other isomers. So, I don't know that maybe it gets a few months ago and has not been removed from the source, the body will probably have time to metabolize those toxins and transform them into the less toxic forms. But due to a number of lab based studies, you know, the parent compounds are more toxic than those metabolites, like 3, 4, 5, 6, 10, and 11. And those talent studies have been done in no, actually, it's uh, no. The, the, uh, there's really not a whole lot of red tide, red toxin studies in people who are There's six papers, seven. Right. So that, that, that's an issue that really needs to be worked out. So it's a very big difference between a correlation and forcing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think, I think this is a good trick because, you know, we really need to know more about this stuff. So my question is kind of that, but I want to ask you, given all the different species of the Bonatoxin, given that they're migratory species, and potentially they could be just getting different strands, different species of it, is there different species maybe they might have metabolized or not? Is there potential for yeah, so I'm going to answer that in a little roundabout way. Um, so, when we did a study on the West Coast of Florida and the West Coast females, we know what was great about that area is they've tagged, satellite tagged, hundreds of those nesting, about 100 of those nesting females. So, we know where they go after they leave the beach, and we know their foraging. So, those animals that are nesting on the West Coast of Florida. Are foraging in one of five places, either right off Tampa Bay um, in the northern Gulf, down in the Yucatan, 
um, down in, in uh, Keys area and perhaps in um, the country. And so I looked, you know, unfortunately my sample size wasn't great, but what we found was that the animals that forage in the west coast of Florida, and no forage in the west coast of Florida, had the highest carbon dioxide concentration. And, and then second with Yucatan, which we really do see some of those trends, some of those old red tides. And then typically in the Keys and in the Caribbean, where red tide is more rare, so those animals have a lower carbon. So it does depend on where they're foraging and where they're moving through chemical impacts. So we need to be able to have a So Satellite tags. So what we do is you fix um, the sand, the turtle shell down, so really clean, and there's a lot of uh, surface area for the. We use um, airplane epoxy to attach these tags to make sure that they last a really long time. But you put the tag on, you put this epoxy on, you let it dry, and then, you know, some of these turtles transmit for a year or more. And what's really cool about the West Coast population is um, the guy that did that tagging research tagged the same animal at the time during different seasons and they always come back to the same forage event. If they forage off the west coast of Florida, they always go to the west coast of Florida. So I think we can have some more time for questions. Um, I'm sure Jennifer will stick around if we can talk for a minute. But now might be a good time to go over the quiz that I've been provided. I'm going to go ahead and take a moment. All right, that's super fun part of this quiz. Um, so, um, so I'll just go over the quiz, and see if I forget. I think I went over most of these in my talk. But number one is during a red tide, the shoals are observed prior to the other river they were with the tree. Number one is true. Um, two, how are sea turtles exposed to red tide toxins? That's all of the above: the inhalation, ingestion, and um, potentially absorption. Um, the most recent red tide bloom, how many turtles stranded? About 1,300. Um, so, D, number four, toxins that are released from the organism that cause turtle red tide are known as gravitoxins, which um, the scientific name is the name of Brevis. You really get that. Um, all those other toxins we see there are other algal toxins. Um, red tide toxins are lipid soluble, meaning they bind to what? That's fat. Um, true false, there's currently no effective treatment for red tide toxicosis. False or are true or um, false, sorry, we are working on that right now. And then number seven, what species most often strand as a result of the water types? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 